So who is actually reading the book, The uh, Birthing a Greater Reality? So I have a funny story to start with, which is when Trish and I, uh, we've been meeting for breakfast every couple months, and then when she said uh, she planned for this week, I was actually going to speak on strength. I was going to do the, the unity power of strength, and then she said, actually the chapter that's coming up that would fall in line with what you're talking about has the Four Noble Truths, and since you were the one that was raised Buddhist, maybe you should talk about the Four Noble Truths. And I said, I said I'd be happy to, but does that mean I have to read the book? <laughs> I have this thing, my mom, when I was growing up, um, my mom, who is a PhD scientist, and I have an undiagnosed learning disability, I super struggled in school, I think I have dyslexia, and reading was really hard for me, for me to get the information and have it come in and stick has been a complexity in my life. Okay, so I have an undiagnosed learning disability, and when I was um, younger, my mom used to, um, what is the word, bribe me to read books in the summer. And she's a PhD and she's super smart and she thought reading was really important and I really struggled reading. So every summer she would say, if you read this many books, you can have a phone in your room. This is how old I am, that you wanted a phone in your own room so that you'd talk to your boyfriend on your own phone in your own room. So, uh, so I did that. So anyway, I have this aversion to being told to read, um, partially because it's hard. So when she asked if I would do that, then I got on Amazon and I bought this book. And I love this book. It is not an easy book, but I am just, I am so grateful. And it just reminds me that we have this ego in us that says, don't make me read that damn book. I don't want to read the book. And then I start reading the book and I am, I'm in tears and I'm, I'm, I'm grateful because what it's reminding me is it's another tool for my spiritual journey. It is basically soul recovery, which is what I've termed this ministry that I have, Recover Your Soul, that we are all here to have soul recovery. We're all wounded. We all have these struggles. We all have all these things. And so Trish, all this time, has been sharing from the book our past, right? Like how we kind of get, as humans, what happens in this diagram of humanity? What is our shadow sides? What are these parts of us? How do we make friends with all these parts of us? This is what Trish has been talking about as we lead up to the tiger and the figure eight and the cage, right? All these things. So I get the chapter, I'm so excited, on waking up. This is where we're taking the heaviness and we're lifting it. We're growing it. We're having more awareness of, yes, life is hard. And this isn't easy, being alive. Being a human being is not easy, and no one is promising that it's easy. But we're talking about this week is we're talking about suffering, which is different than pain. And the first noble truth is that life is suffering. And when I was growing up Buddhist in New Mexico, as a hippie Buddhist, as some of you know my stories, that I heard that as, as a truth. Now, in all of our young life, we hear things from our parents, we're picking up things from our parents that create our belief systems, that create the paradigms in which we live, right? And I listened to a podcast recently that was super, super interesting about beliefs, and it was um, Hidden Brain. Anybody listen to Hidden Brain? I love that podcast. And it was about... Um, that you either have as a foundational belief that life and the world is safe or that life and the world is dangerous. So without thinking about it too much, who innately just thinks that life and the world is a little bit dangerous? And it's, this is no judgment. This is just, this is how we were raised. And who innately thinks, oh yeah, life is safe, it's all good. Right? This is a foundational piece of who we are. And actually, if we notice that this is who we are, it helps us in all of these spiritual teachings, teachings and learnings about how we got here and what we think and feel and believe and how we interact with the people around us. 
And it also helps us understand our ego structure. And to be in spirituality, what we're learning is we're learning how to embrace our wholeness. We're learning how to love every aspect of us, every shadow, every bright light, everything. And what we do and how we are in the world is generally about not doing that. It's really about staying small, hiding, being afraid, trying not to be in pain, trying not to be in fear. We'll actually see if I use any of my quotes. So when I was raised and I was taught that life is suffering, just like all those attachments that we get that help develop whether life is safe or life is dangerous. And so for me, life is suffering. I was given the paradigm that life is safe. But what I took as a kid in the life is suffering was that I should be in pain, that my mal-ease that I have as a tendency of depression and anxiety, that this is just the way that it is. And I didn't know the three other noble truths yet, right? Just like how when we're growing up, parents give us these, these rules, but we don't have all of it yet. So we, we create our whole construct. That's what Trish was talking about before. And then, and then you start to grow up and you start to look. And, and what the second noble truth is, is that the suffering comes from desire. And my mom and I talk a lot about how that's not really easy to understand that you think about desire. So it means the suffering comes from because I want a new car, or I want a different job, or I want a boyfriend, or I want a girlfriend, or I want my boyfriend or girlfriend to be different. It's not actually from the wanting it. It's from the clinging to it. It's from the grasping of how we want it to be which the Buddha said that there are three facets that cause suffering. The first is attachment, which is this grasping, craving, clinging. The second is resistance, my resistance to read the book, right? And the third is delusion. So I will take the first quote, my beautiful assistant, thank you. So in the book, he says, delusion, when we are not aware of the true cause of our suffering, we will continuously project the cause into our environment. We will believe that someone or something external to us is responsible for our suffering. And this is delusion. Something outside of us causes our suffering. Now, first I wanna say that Pain and pleasure are part of being alive. The, the spiritual journey is not necessarily that we're supposed to not feel. What it actually means is that you are supposed to feel, that, that there is pain in a loss of a relationship. There is joy in the birth of a child. There is joy in looking out at the beautiful sky and noticing the, the glory of this morning. And then there's an attachment to, oh, it's gonna snow tomorrow, it's gonna be a crappy day, so we're, we can't even be in the joy. Oh, the baby's gonna grow up, you know, too soon. We, we're not in the presence of that joy of that moment. Or we're attached to why we're not happy because of there's something on the outside. It's this craving, it's this wanting it to be different that creates the unhappiness. So the suffering comes not from the feelings, the suffering comes from our attachment. And that is the foundational part of Buddhism. And in spirituality, if we can wake up to this, it's a foundational part of our awareness of like, oh, I thought the world was why I'm pissed off. I thought the world was why I'm unhappy. I was, my husband and I went out um, Friday night and I'm just driving, you know, and he's like, God, that driver makes me, why is that person, and I'm just like, why are you paying attention to this, you know, I'm, I am the one who's driving. And he's just complaining about every single driver on the highway. I'm thinking to myself, suffering, 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 suffering. I could give a crap. 
because I've done the work. I used to care how they was on the car, you know, the, the mind training is starting with the small things. The mind training is starting with the drivers. The mind training is starting with the little things that irritate us so that by the time you get to your husband, you've worked on it, right? I have worked on it and, and I can successfully say my husband does not irritate me nearly as much as he used to. <laughs> Serious. Addiction also is this part that comes from us seeking out, not feeling. I'm a recovered alcoholic. I used alcohol to celebrate. I used alcohol to check out. I used alcohol to numb. I used alcohol eventually to hope I was gonna die. Five years ago, I was, I was praying for death. And to have been in that place where I spent 10 years blaming the world for my unhappiness and my anxiety, I was so, I had so much anxiety. I couldn't get out of bed without being afraid of what was gonna happen for the day. And I think about who I was in that past and that was the suffering, that was the attachment, that was the clinging to a life that I thought should be different. And I think that it's because our ego is attached to the happily ever after. I looked up, at, I was up at two in the morning working on this because I was trying to, I really wanted to please Trish and do the right thing and really cover the book because you know me, I usually just come up here and say whatever I want. So, um, so I started thinking about the heavily, happily ever after and I looked it up and it said that it was about 400 years ago that it was first used in Italy. Now we think life is hard right now. Let's be honest, it is not that hard right now. We have comfort beyond the dreams of people four or five or 600 years ago. We have running water and we can go to the grocery store and even if we are poor, we can buy food that is ready to come home. We didn't have to pick it, we didn't have to grow it, we didn't have to trade for it, we didn't have to go and poop out in the outhouse or in a chamber pot, you know. I mean, we have no concept of the complexity of how hard it was at some point, not that long ago. And so 400 years ago, it was brought up this happily ever after as this concept of escape. That life was so hard that there could be this belief that there was a happily ever after, and that's crap, right? There is no happily ever after. And it has forever tainted our self, this ego part of us that wants to be pleased, that wants to be um, soothed, that doesn't want it to be hard. Well, life is hard, but the suffering is optional. The feeling is what it is. It's the suffering that's optional. Okay, I will take my quote number two. So he says that the ego, our ego derived of our sense of self, develops from a strategy designed to get what we want. I added need, I added want, right? To get what we need and avoid pain and anxiety. Now this idea of our ego is so interesting because um, Freud came, started really talking about it, and about 100 years ago, the psychologist started really talking about it, and it got this bad rap, right? That this ego is this bad part of ourselves. I just finished the year of studying the Course in Miracles, and anybody in here, Course in Miracles person, love me some Course in Miracles. This book is like this thick, right? And um, you read it and your brain just gets like all fuzzy and you can't understand what it is. I listen to it on Audible. That's how I listen. I learn best is Audible. And, um, and it just kind of swirls around until it breaks you down into a place where you're like, yeah, the ego isn't bad. It just is this aspect of ourself that thinks that we're separate that thinks that we, this being, has to be attached to this thing that we, this individual part of ourselves, and we lose our connection with everyone. We can lose our connection with spirit. We lose our connection with ourselves because we're so attached to our self-worth, our opinion, 
I was listening to Pema Chotran's book, When Things Fall Apart, um, on the way down. I've been listening to that. Another gift to God, like right at the exact time to listen to it. I've had that book on my bookshelf for 15 years, never opened it, started listening to it while I was reading this book. Uh, perfect, right? Goes with all of this stuff. Highly recommend it. Absolutely fantastic. And she was talking about our opinions, our attachment to our opinion. So the Course of Miracles helped me to truly see that our perception is what causes our suffering, our perception of ourselves. So the ego, I just want to say before um, we move on to the, that part, if we didn't have our ego, we wouldn't be here today. If you didn't have your ego, you wouldn't get in your car, drive to work, have built a house back in the days when you had to build your own house. You wouldn't stand up for hard things. You, you, would, you would not do stuff. Like the ego was so valuable to have this awareness of, of our individuality. It's the attachment to that as being special and separate that makes us hurt, that causes conflict. It isn't about the fact that you can't have high self-esteem, that you can't think things on your own, that you can't be special. You are special. Each and every one of you was brought here on this earth to, to present your unique gifts to the world. We need you. You are the teachers and the light of the world. You are, you are so valuable, every single one of you, for every gift, Ryan, for his singing. And, and, and I know people here for their gifts. Every single one of us needs these gifts. And so that part of ourself, that part of our ego, is so important. It's this attachment to, I am special. I need to be something special. I'm more special than you, and my opinions are better than yours. That's the dark underbelly that we need to heal. So then we come to the sleeping of Adam, which I think is fascinating because when Trish was asking me, she said, well, can you talk about Maya? And I was like, what's that? I never heard of Maya. I'm Buddhist, right? Never heard of that. I loved learning something new. Maya is the illusion, right? Just spent a year learning about the illusion in The Course of Miracles. Our illusion is the dream that we make, our concepts, our beliefs of what things are. I raised two kids, same house. You ask them stories, they'll tell you totally different perceptions of what our life was like when they were growing up. Totally different. One kid thought it was a house of hell, and the other kid thought it was a house of fantastic fun. Same stuff. Same house. As I was talking about this to Rich, and I was talking about reality, and I was said, you know, where we, we, we make up a reality, and he goes, this, this banister I made, that's real. What do you say about that? And I said, yeah, that's a good question. And then I was reading, oh, there it is. As human beings, we are given concepts by our family that say, is, the ha is life safe or is it dangerous? What, what does our language say? In um, Alaskan, whatever, what, Eskimo, there's a hundred words for snow because there's a hundred different ways that this snow is. They see snow different than we see snow. To me, cold, wet snow. To them, it's this, you know, is it slippery? Is it icy? Is it, you know? And I thought of that banister, and I thought, what if you were a germ on the banister and the consciousness of the germ? It doesn't see the banister the same. It's a huge universe to the, to the, to the germ. That whole thing is its whole universe. We are so conceptualized in what we think is real. In the book, he says that my mom was a spectro spectroscopist, so I should know this, but I don't, that of the whole light continuum, we see this much. Tiny. 
And his example was, we say that an apple is red. And that's because that's what our eyes see, because that's what our brain has developed for. There may be a bug that doesn't think that that apple is red. That bug sees ultraviolet light, and it's like a, you know, rainbow. We don't know. But we, we're positive that it's a red apple, and we'll stand on that hill until we die saying, this is real. Well, what if everything is like that? What if everything is like that, that our perception of it is our own choice of what our perception is of it, and we stand on the hill in our life and we demand that our opinions are right, and we suffer, and we disconnect from each other from it. The third noble truth says that, did I do my third quote yet? Okay, let me go to the third quote, okay. So Maya, I'll do the third quote. So Maya um, was this new word, which totally makes sense, but it's the illusion of the dualistic universe, meaning that we're separate, in which we appear to exist separate from all beings in a matrix of time and space, when that our reality, we're, when we're in that reality, we're caught in delusion. And when we believe that Maya can satisf satisfy us, or is permanent or real, we can create conditions for suffering because we live in the world that we constructed. So this is hard to understand. And in listening to, thank you, and in listening to uh, Pema Chotran, and she was really talking about this, you know, one of the three characteristics of Maya is impermanence and that we want everything to be the same, we don't want it to change. We're changing every minute, every day, every second. We're new, we're different, we're awake, we're asleep. Life is different. I've been married for uh, 29 years. I've been together with my husband for 31 years. And I was talking to somebody recently and I said, you know, I've been married a million times to a million different men. And he's been married to a whole bunch of million different women too. I am substantially different than I was when we first stood on that altar and got married. The truth is I'm different than I was a week ago. And if I'm constantly attaching to how he should be, which I did, which is what made me be an alcoholic and caused me to be in suffering and misery, I was attached to his to wanting certainty. I wanted certainty in our lives. I wanted certainty in him. I, I was attached to that. And I, I've told this story. My mom's house burned down in the fire uh, in December, a year ago. And she lost everything. She's a Buddhist. She's a practicing Buddhist. And you know what? The first thing she said is impermanence. It's gonna be okay. And she has been a profound teacher in allowing it to be and being okay. She's in Nepal right this minute on a trip to go see her spiritual teacher, which is amazing. She just had lung cancer surgery. You know, she's out there like doing her thing because she said, I'm not gonna be held back by my house burning down, by having cancer. I have a life to live. And if I hold on to this part that says this should be bad, then she's suffering, but she won't do it. She absolutely won't do it. She's determined to be happy. And I, I'm so excited. I was texting with her this morning. It's night there. She's in the future. <laughs> so then there's you know the waking up. This Just knowing this, just starting to have awareness of this, just starting to think like, oh, my thoughts might just be mine. This world that I think is so real might just be my own construct. This might just be what I think. One of my greatest things I got out of The Course in Miracles is a term that, that is the foundation of my being. It is as I choose to see it. Everything. It is as I choose to see it. My husband can be a dick or he can be lovely in the same moment. I pick 
which one it is. The world can be crazy and horrible, or it can be magnificent and beautiful in any moment. It is as I choose to see it. And this is the freedom, this is the waking up. Again, learned something in the book, Ray's Buddhist, should know this story, but I loved the story about Buddha that said that he had sat under the Bodhi tree, he had had enlightenment, and he's walking and he's glowing. And you see people like that, that are awake, and they're glowing, and this man stops him and he says, are you a god? And he says, no. And he says, are you a man? And he says, no. And he said, what are you? And he said, I'm awake. And it turns out Buddha means awake. Again, I'm just, I'm learning. I'm new to the learning thing. I'm digging it. It's all good. I feel like I'm not enlightened, but something happened to me in the last five years in my development. I woke up, and I realized that my husband is just a man who is trying to figure his stuff out. And I realized life is just life, and people are just people. And the more compassion that I had, the more awareness that I had, the more tenderness that I had for me first, for me first, all those shadow parts, all those dark places, all those bits of myself that, that are hard to understand, if I could love those parts of me first and realize that my opinions are just my thoughts, and it is as I choose to see it, then I would see it in a new and beautiful way, and I could choose to not suffer. I have a friend here who said he came to see me at another talk, and they had lunch after, and he said that a man sat down next to him and he said, hi, I am so-and-so, what's your name? And he gave him his name, and I think the story is, and he said, you know, tell me something about yourself. And he said the man was quiet. And then his response was, I've stopped suffering, something along those lines. I've, I've stopped suffering. It's not the happily ever after. It doesn't mean that there's happily ever after. It means that you stand in the, in the midst of a storm it means that life is happening around you. It means your house burns down. It means that someone breaks up with you. It means that your car falls apart. It means your relationship falls apart, your job falls apart. And you stand there and you feel it. And you let the humanness wash through you. This is the gift of being human, the hard parts too. But you don't suffer because you're not clinging to what there's unclingable. You're not trying to control the uncontrollable. Recover your soul is really about not being in control, it turns out, as it progresses. And my clarity is we try to control everything outside of ourselves, and our pain and suffering comes from that desire to control. That's my first step in soul recovery. So I will close with the last quote, so we're going to skip. So the last quote is, um, yeah. Kalo Rinpoche said this, and the reason why I was brought to tears when I read this in the book, and I'm going to try not to cry right now. He's the teacher that came in the 70s that inspired my mom. And there was a bunch of teachers that came right around that time in the late 60s and the 70s. And it's just wild that of all the teachers and all the quotes in this book is Kala Rinpoche, who I sat on his lap as a little girl. And I took refuge from this man which means it's kind of like being baptized when you're Buddhist and you bend over and they cut off a little piece of your hair and you take refuge. So I wasn't baptized, but I, but I did do that when I was little of my own volition freely and beautifully. And so Kala Rebbeche was this, was the teacher that started everything in my life for Buddhism. And, and it's profound that I have come full circle from being Buddhist and then rejecting Christianity, as you heard my story of my 
my grandmother and her attempt to save me. And, and then through all of it, I found spirituality. And, and my tagline of Recover Your Soul is a spiritual path to a happy and healthy life. Because to recover from addiction, truly recover from addiction, and we are all addicted to control, and we're all addicted to ourselves, we need to put spirit in that place. We need to release the illusion. We need to let go of our grasping and our, our deep need to have our ego filled and open up. And what he says is, you live in the illusion and appearance of things. There is a reality, but you don't know it. If you wake up to that reality, and you know that you are nothing, and being nothing, you are everything. When we can let go of our ego, this part of us that keeps us separate, there's this tenderness, this love underneath, this kindness, this deep well of compassion and the ability to stand in the midst of anything and be okay and feel it and not need to check out and be awake. What a gift. What an amazing opposite for this hardship that is the complexity of life. And so in the end, the happily ever after is different than what we thought it was. It's really an acceptance, a deep acceptance for self. Okay, I know I went over, so let's go ahead and move into a time of meditation, Ryan. offer for you to take that in that you are holy you are whole that you can release all that no longer serves you that you can open your heart allowing the feelings to break you open to find that tenderness inside the wholeness that you are that letting go and releasing and realizing that in nothing there is everything, that you are safe here, you are loved here, you are whole. We are holy, holy, holy. We are holy, holy, holy. Oh 